सहनौ सहनौ भुनक्तु सह वीर्यम करवावहि तेजस्वी नावधीतमस्तु मायुषावहि ओम शांति 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 हरि हि ओम स्थापकाय च धर्मस्य सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिने अवतार वरिष्ठाय रामकृष्णाय ते नम सुस्मृतिपुराण आल करुणाल नमा भगवत्द शंकर लोकशंकर सो दिस इज द लास्ट सेशन ऑफ द सीरीज ऑफ डिस्कशन ऑन दिस वेरी वेल नोन वेदांतिक टेक्स्ट so the text has got as i mentioned earlier uh, 585 verses and in some other versions may be one or two less or more um, it essentially deals with the uh, the problem of reality the text uh, tells you that most of the problems we face in life are due to the wrong priorities that we adopt in our life we look upon the unreal as the real the impermanent and as the permanent the relative as the absolute and the transient as the unchangeable it's so often this wrong perception of life values and also world creates a lot of problems so how to set right this order of priority that's a basic principle here so the text begins with a very unique uh, idea and the author shankaracharya tells us that this human life itself is a great privilege it's a great blessing uh if we look upon creation as a whole there are uh, innumerable species countless species of which human being alone can stand outside the flow of biological evolution and analyze his own life or her own life what's the meaning of life where am i going what is it that really matters but the mystery of human suffering and happiness so these questions can be asked only by human beings it is these questions that actually take us just above this sensory world these questions were raised by not only spiritual seekers but also by mystics by poets by writers by uh, creative writers by painters all of them ask this question and they all uh, reach somewhere but not always at the highest spiritual level they don't get the final answer they get only some relative answers so when you write a poem when you imagine and when you draw a painting you are actually raising yourself above the sensory world otherwise just a good house wonderful clothes and food that's enough that's enough for you for an, for the animals for human beings especially those who are highly evolved look for something higher something above the sensory world so this is famous verse the jindu nam nara janma durlabham adar kunstu kunstum tato viprata tasmat vaidika dharma marga paradan vidyuttu asmat param आत्मात्म विवेचन स्वनुभव ब्रह्मात्मना संस्थिति मुक्तिर्नो शतकोड शतजन्मकोडि सुखदेहि पुण्य बिना लभ्यते दिस वर्ड्स द मीनिंग इज दिस द प्रिविलेज द यूनिक ब्लेसिंग ऑफ ह्यूमन बर्थ एंड देन बीइंग बोर्न विद अ विद अ सेंस ऑफ डिसर्निंग माइंड एंड इंटरेस्ट इन स्क्रिप्चर्स interest in spiritual ideas that's also very common 
you may not become uh, you uh, mystic you may not realize god but even an interest in things other than things of this world that itself is very rare you if the total the percentage of humanity who have interest in things other than things of this world a very small in fact and among them interest in spiritual subjects in questions of life and death in fundamental questions of human existence that is still rare and even there are even among them who have some understanding of scriptures higher spiritual ideas doctrines those who are interested in, in the intellectual questions of these important questions of human existence and life there are very few who take to an active inquiry who translate that intellectual quest into life as a whole to i mean those who order their life accordingly so this doesn't happen unless you have uh, done a lot of good meritorious deeds so the textual translation is more uh, pedantic maybe more textual technical but uh, it has got this meaning is difficult for living beings to obtain human birth and so much more difficult to be born um, uh, with a uh, sense of inquiry into spiritual life to be born as a brahmin brahmin should be understood not in the narrow casteist sense somebody who is interested in the ved veda dhyana ki vipraha vipra is the word used in brahmins mean to study the vedas in a broader sense those who are interested in the higher questions of life and existence very few and among them those there are very few who get an opportunity to study scriptures and acquire some degree of scholarship erudition in scriptures and even among them there are very few who are the discerning man many of them sell their knowledge for money but it scholars all of them all of those who have spent decades for learning scriptures are not necessarily spiritual seekers they learn these scriptures they learn this higher spiritual ideas philo- philosophical systems just as they study uh, business management both serve the same purpose you may teach in a university you may get salary or you may do business and you may get profit so frequently even among those who study these scriptures there are still a smaller number who have with this sense of inherent uh, sense of discerning spiritual discerning wisdom and among them those who can dedicate their life and their efforts to this higher pursuit still few so that's why he glorifies the privilege of human birth so that's the beginning of the text <coughs> then the, the discussion continues durlabam trayame vaidu daivanugraha geetukam manushyuttum mumukshuttum mahapurusha samshay again three privileges being born as a human being and then being born as a human beings with an interest for spiritual liberation and again even after that an opportunity to connect with people to associate with people whose association may help them in the spiritual life that is mahapurusha samshay that is still rare so the mumukshuttam is an important uh, qualification here if we have a kind of divine discontentment or divine dissatisfaction with things of this world going through these different experiences in life in life cycles one after another and then feel a kind of feeling of dissatisfaction that is also very rare and that's what leads to mumukshuttu liberation it come life itself many people want to live <coughs> clinging to life as to means so when we read the scriptures we should not get away with the impression that the scripture is teaching a kind of cynicism skepticism 
No, what it means is, so clinging to life, you find that word used in Vedanta scriptures, what it means is clinging to sensory pleasures, clinging to physical, biological experiences alone without any, any interest in higher meaning of life and existence. So when we feel that, well, this is, the, this is not enough, there is something beyond this, then we start thinking of some higher transcendent experience. That is Mumukshutta. And even after that, it is not enough. Uh, it is very interesting that this author, who is a great philosopher, tells you that association with the spiritual, fellow spiritual seekers is an important aspect of spiritual life. Because every moment, every day, every time, when we talk to people, if we are not fully established in our own spiritual path, there is every possibility that our mind and our ideas could be influenced by uh, undesirable or unhelpful ideas coming from other sources. So, it is important for a beginner in spiritual life to seek the company of fellow spiritual seekers. So that's how the text proceeds. And then the author uh, gives two sets of qualifications for every spiritual seeker. So one, one verse that is maybe those who are interested, 16th verse. It tells you about some general qualifications of a spiritual aspirant. So, he should be intelligent. Intelligent here doesn't mean high IQ alone. A kind of intelligence that helps you to enjoy higher spiritual ideas. So, intelligent is frequent, intelligence is frequently a neutral word. It is a neutral substance. Some of the scourges of humanity were very intelligent. In the sense, they have very high IQ. Their ability to understand, their routine, and all these were wonderful. But they were they have not always been a great blessing for the humanity. So here Metha is word the word used. Metha is purified, refined, processed intelligence. An intelligence that feels a true when it connects with, when it confronts higher spiritual ideas. This is a natural characteristic. So one of the Vedic prayers is, O oh Mother, give me intelligence. Mai metha, mai praja, mai akniste, jodhadhadu. Metha of this higher intelligence, this higher uh, uh, purified intellect is looked upon as a goddess in, in the Ayurveda. So there is a suktam, a hymn, it's called Metha Suktam. So it begins Metha Devi, Dushamana, Naga, Vishwajit, Bhadra, Sumana, Simana, etc. And the prayer ends with, Oh Mother, give me this purified, clear, processed intelligence. And uh, many of the ancient Vedic prayers were prayers addressed to uh, this, this uh, purified intelligence in the form of a, a, a sacred deity, is a, is a goddess. So Gayatri Mantra is actually a prayer for this purified intelligence. Bhargo Devasya Thi Mahi Thi mentioned here. Thi is purified intelligence. It's a prayer. Gayatri Mantra is meant for that. So in the morning, uh, the ancient sages used to invoke the presence of this purified intelligence uh, manifesting in the form of Gayatri a Divine Mother in the form of pure intelligence, pure discerning wisdom and will uh, plead to the Mother to manifest in Him in the form of purified intelligence. And the evening, uh, uh, you know, Uttame Shikhari Devi lament, Oh Mother, now you go back to your uh, abode above the mountains and next day to come back again. So you can find this higher uh, intelligence, purified intelligence, was praised uh, uh, as a, an embodiment of the highest human uh, gift, actually. So, 
so adhigari atma vidya yam utta lakshana lakshidana so one uh, one important qualification mentioned is the ability to accept what is to be accepted and also the ability to reject to filter out what is to be avoided that's very important you may have the best of intelligence but still if you don't have the power of discerning wisdom you may accept what is wrong what is undesirable and what is inappropriate and it is better to be a, a moron than to be intelligent enough to accept the wrong ideas you know actually most of the problems that spiritual seekers face is due to lack of this higher power of discrimination of discerning wisdom uha is the power the natural ability to accept is an automatic faculty if if our mind is pure if we pray if we do any spiritual practice you find our mind or intelligence will evolve a kind of mechanism is it with something very interesting i just mentioned it some time back people who are supposed to be dull who are supposed to be the opposite of intellectuals you find some of them will have a unique gift of avoiding of being immune to wrong ideas they move away if somebody tells wrong things you find this automatically move away because somehow they feel they don't feel at home with the wrong persons the wrong company you find it that that means metha can bless you without giving you the ability to read books or to become philosophers so that is your uha and so it comes together when we develop the ability to accept what is appropriate we also develop the ability to filter out to reject mentally what is inappropriate so apoha means an inherent capacity is not the oh let me analyze the right or wrong this is work it is very important it is actually an inst- instinctive mechanism of the mind that we evolve and this happens when we purify our mind a great intellect a great uh, a physicist or uh, nobel prize winning scientist would have this ability frequently they are the opposite of it so what the, the ability to learn physics or mathematics or chemistry doesn't help you to accept what is to be accepted in life and to reject what is to be rejected so uha poha vichakshana 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 means a natural instinctive capacity faculty and you have a lot of it's a vichakshana means expertise and shankaracharya surprisingly says this is very crucial in spiritual life and it is again not a result of logical analysis it is not a result of philosophical analysis or high iq but then it is the natural result of our mind getting more and more pure so it it develops a unique immunity a power to resist wrong ideas and a natural instinctive capacity and tendency to absorb to be interested to feel at home with the right ideas so if uh, let us say if vedanta discussion is going and prayer is going oh i don't feel at home okay. it means he may be he may win a nobel prize but this metha is not it is other side so that's why adhigari atma vidyaya utta lakshana lakshana you find such abilities in all traditions maybe the only the most telling illustration that i can find in the in the christian tradition two examples one is saint joseph who was born in italy in what go cupertino not the cupertino of silicon valley but cupertino in italy he was born in 18th 16th century and was canonized in 17th century he was a very dull person extremely dull but he has a natural instinctive capacity to respond to the church bells whenever he heard church bells he got he kind of ecstasy another example which i already quoted and it was the way of a pilgrim the humble pilgrim who learned the jesus prayer so you find these are examples of what shankaracharya says metha with pure intelligence pure intellectual capacity purified intelligence 
which expresses itself in a natural ability, instinctive ability to accept what is appropriate for spiritual life and an equally powerful capacity to reject what is inappropriate. So these are general qualifications in all traditions. Maybe it goes even beyond the, the context of spiritual life. Then in the 18th verse there is again, the commentator says, no, I am going to tell you some specific qualifications. Sadhanani, Yatra, Chattwari, Adhidhani, Manishi, Pihi. Yeshu, Satsweva, Sannishtha, Yadha, Bhave, Nasiddhiri. This is so, in the, in the 19th verse, the, okay, the writer gives a list of four important qualifications that are essential for every student of Vedanta. In a more or less general context, it has it applies to spiritual seekers all over the world. One is Nitya Nitya Vastu Vega in Sanskrit means the ability to accept and to respond to the real, to what really matters, the high and absolute reality and to automatically avoid, renounce the unreal. This happens at all levels. As we evolve in spiritual life, uh, we also evolve this capacity and something very important that you find is biological maturity doesn't help us. That's a very important point. An old aged person doesn't necessarily develop this capacity. He may develop certain abilities and faculties in some other areas because the reason is our mental system never gets old. So our ideal impulses Emotions, tendencies, samskaras, vasanas, all these, kurtis, all these, which are accumulated in the mental system called chittam, they express themselves in the form of our attitudes and ideas and emotions. So they don't get old. In fact, they remain intact and they are born, they are handed over to, eat, to a new life. It's almost like a relay, you know. A, from 400 meters, 800 meters relay, you baton exchange. Baton doesn't change, then the new runner big takes it up and continues on. So in every life cycle, this uh, baggage of samskaras and impressions and vrittis and attitudes are inherited, they don't get to old. That's why even people who are of old years, they don't get spiritual wisdom just by virtue of being old in years. And a young person may also not necessarily, may not be immature. So it all depends upon to what extent we have done spiritual practices, spiritual sadhanas. That's what really counts in spiritual life. And it's a very important point to remember. That is, biological maturity doesn't correspond to Spiritual maturity in life, that's all. In all other abilities, in all the areas we may get, gather more and more expertise because the mind doesn't change. Mind may not uh, implement the impulses and impressions in old days because the instruments for implementing these emotions have become weak or benumbed or atrophied. So that doesn't mean they remain in the mental system as fertile seeds. If they are sown again in fertile soil, they will sprout. So that's why through spiritual practices we have to burn these seeds of tendencies and samskaras. And that requires these qualifications, spiritual practices. So Ika Mutra Parabhoga Viraga means a kind of renunciation. This uh, kind of dispassion, uh, detachment uh, towards things of this world, towards things of enjoyment, either in this world or even a desire to enjoy heavenly converts. Uh, of course, you have to remember, you know, the word heaven used in Vedantic context is different from what it means in the Judo Christian, Abrahamic, or Islamic, Abrahamic religious context. Heaven in Christianity or Islam or Judaism uh, has a spiritual element in it. You are, you are living with God, you are, you know, you are uh, 
you are actually there's a presence of the divine in in heaven as understood in the Abrahamic religious traditions. In Vedanta, heaven is just a five star hotel, as you mentioned. Only you don't have to pay money. It is just you do a lot of good deeds with selfish desires in this life as a result. Do you go to some higher place, we enjoy and you come back again when these good results are exhausted. That's what heaven means in Vedanta, Mimamsa, Indian philosophical context. So it is not a big deal. It is something that people, true spiritual seekers consider going to heaven as a hindrance, as an obstacle in Vedanta context. So that should be understood because those who have read uh, uh, you know, Augustine's City of God <laughs> eh, or Confessions will may misunderstand. Heaven is something not so desirable in Vedanta. It is not the heaven as Augustine talks about in the city of God that is meant here. It is heaven, it is a place where people just enjoy worldly things, that is all, nothing more. So that is not a very wonderful thing. When one should develop a total dispassion and renunciation to those things in order to be a true spiritual seeker. And then when this happens, you know, one after another, this uh, each the preceding one becomes the cause of the following one. When you have a sense of real and unreal, you feel a sense of renunciation for the unreal. And then what happens? When we are no more interested in these transient worldly things, then that gives us, that's what actually gives us a kind of mental maturity, restraint, the ability to restrain the senses. It is called Samadhi Shatka Sampati. You already discussed, I mean, control, restraining mind and senses, and withdrawing the mind from external objects, and a concentration on higher spiritual topics, accepting things with a sense of sanctity. All these become natural for a person who is focusing himself on the real and automatically develops a dispassion for the unreal. And then what happens? Then we will actually look for something higher, Mumukshutu. After this, uh, the order, and that's a very interesting thing, he discusses a number of interesting topics which I am not going to repeat right now. He uh, discusses uh, what are the qualifications for a teacher, how to approach, it, uh, approach a teacher, and seven questions are raised by the student. In fact, the whole uh, text is a discussion of the seven questions and answers to the seven questions. First question, what is bondage? Kovanama Bentha, Kathamesha Agadhava, how this came? 51st verse of the text. Then Kathamesha Pradishthasya, how this bondage continues? How to get out of this bondage? And what is the unreal, the non-Atman? What is the real, absolute reality? What is Atman? And how to properly understand uh, what is real, what is unreal? Please tell me, these are seven questions. And first, the teacher addresses this question, what is non-Atman? That is very interesting. Because frequently, we are all living, most ordinary people are living in the realm of the non-Atman. Our senses, our mind, our impulses, our experiences, this world, our mind, intellect, all these, they constitute the unreal. And every time when we identify ourselves with this unreal, we forget the real. So the author discusses the physical body, the gross body, the subtle body consisting of eight units, mind, intellect, memory system and egoism and the five senses of perception, five senses of action. Then desire, action for fulfilling those desires, all rooted in ignorance of our true nature. So all these are given as constituting what is unreal, what is known Atman. And every time when we identify ourselves with these unreal things, we forget our true nature. This is the cause of bondage. So the only way is to focus on the real and the real, the absolute reality is Atman which is omnipresent, present everywhere, present in all of us, is a transcendental reality, it's our true nature. 
beyond the psychophysical mechanism, mind and intellect, emotions and feelings, there is this in the dweller, it is Atman, that's our true nature. Once we realize this, then we are out of this bondage. This is the overall structure of the book. Now we are dealing with some, we will discuss some uh, verses which we didn't discuss yesterday. So those of you who have got text, you can go to 374th verse. So this is a very interesting verse. It says, the verse tells you dispassion or non-attachment towards worldly objects and a spiritual awareness of our true nature they are like the two wings of a bird. Both should be dead. So that is dispassion, having no interest, non -at or, non or having non-attachment, freedom from attachment towards the unreal, towards the worldly things on the one hand, and awareness of the true nature. Vairagi bodhu purushasya bhakshivati, like a bird. Two wings, Paksho Vijani Hi Vijakshana Tum. So these are two wings of human life. If we can have these two wings, one is every time when we feel uh, any kind of uh, any problem, like so this is not necessarily for a spiritual seeker only, even in ordinary life. Whenever something confronts us, something that has a damaging effect on the mind, that devastates our mind, that unsettles our mind, we can just dismiss them out of place. Oh, it all belongs to the unreal. So very often, as I mentioned, when we try to look for permanence in impermanent things, and when we don't find permanence in impermanent things, that's what actually Creates anxiety or, dis or disappoint in our system. So once we develop this kind of dispassion towards the unreal and focus on the real and the spiritual awareness, awareness or alertness, then that they act as two birds, our life, our spiritual life will be secure and safe. Any kind of deviation from this is it is death. That's a very interesting word used here. So in this text you find there are two approaches. One, this absence of awareness of our true nature or our tendency to identify ourselves with the unreal. It is called pramada. This pramada can be considered to be death. And this pramada also can be sleep. So spiritual sleep. So that's the, the another text in the Mandukya Kariga Godapada, you see, it's a commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad. So Anadi Maya Supto Yudha Jiva Prabhudhidi Ajamanidrama Supnam Dvidam Vidhidi Tatha. So the emergence of the spiritual awareness, the ability to identify ourselves, to be Atman. It will be something higher than mind and body and intellect. This emergence of wisdom is like waking up from a deep slumber. It is kind of sleep. On the other hand, and this sleep is death actually, spiritually speaking. So, pramadu brahmanishthaya na kartavya kadajana pramadu mrutyavitya bhagavan brahmanasura. So, it is, I mean, the author is referring to a great statement from, um, uh, from uh, Sanasuja, Sanasuja, you know, Sanat Kumara, you know, famous book is Sanasuja Diya. Means, he says, carelessness, negligence, all these can be death. So, death at the physical level, is not a big deal. That's what Vedanta tells you. Because you are just changing your flight. 
that is a tip for playing you take continue with you but pramada or carelessness or negligence or and in fact it expresses in real life as a kind as a tendency to take things for granted that's how it works mind becomes careless this pramada operates in in mind in the form of an attitude a tendency to take things for granted so once we start taking things for granted we lose our guard we lose our alertness and that can lead to death spiritual death uh, yesterday i studied day for yesterday i gave the two examples of jet of uh, parikshit and uh, jadabharda jadabharda story is very interesting you know so uh, if we forget our true nature for a split second and identify ourselves with any of the worldly things and if that leads to some kind of worldly experience that can delay our liberation by several life cycles that's why this pramada is considered looked upon as death because it kills our alertness you it was another great book where um, this is referred to another non vedantic i won't say non vedantic non hindu rather is the buddhist dhammapada is where you find dhammapada the last uh, i mean 26th uh, maybe 26th chapter there is a description of a spiritually illumined soul so tam buhi bamanam that is the pali expression in the dhammapada number of verses you find it all ends with tam buhi bamanam be in sanskrit tam bruhi brahmanam so that becomes in his more primitive prakrit or pali expression becomes tam buhi bam so buddha uh, repeats this buddhist tradition repeats again and again who is an enlightened person an enlightened person is one who always remains in a state of awareness and who is always free from this pramada uh, this negligence this non awareness he may slip into the abyss of self delusion due to lack of awareness uh, so that you find in the it's almost uh, uh, reads like in some kind of a distant uh, remote version of the uh, description of siddha prajna lakshana i mean the characteristics of a spiritually enlightened person mentioned in the second chapter of gita from 55 to 72 verse uh, in 18 verses the or uh, the teacher lord krishna gives the characteristics the qualifications or the natural characteristics of a spiritually illumined soul you find this more or less the same ideas are repeated again in dhammapada and the, the underlying theme is be careful be aware of the danger of pramada non alertness so is repeated again and again then in the 336th verse there is a very interesting that second emphasizes the importance of spiritual maturity as something beyond biological or physical maturity ka pandita sadasat viveki sudhi pramana paramartha darshi jnanhi kurya asado avalambam subhata hetu ko sisuvat bumukshu ko she stated here so a person may be very learned and uh, he may know in theory many of these ideas but in spiritual maturity he may be like a child so a really learned person with this awareness he will not behave like a child he will not 
have recourse to the adrial which he knows it will cause his fall so pada hetu means it may be the cause of his own fall so the other says a truly illumined person will not be a victim to this carelessness of pramada because he knows that it will lead to his downfall because one may be biologically old but spiritually childish there's a difference between childishness and childlikeness childishness refers to idiocy foolishness childish immaturity childlikeness is the natural characteristic of the most exalted spiritual person well he transcends he goes beyond the natural uh, received uh, acceptable norms of behavior he doesn't contradict them but he transcends them so you find uh, you in the uh, you find this in the teachings of many great spiritual teachers the child like simplicity no childish uh, immaturity so two different things so here the other says a really living person will not be a victim of this childish immaturity because he knows that this can lead to his own uh, downfall so then uh, of course uh, again this idea is repeated i uh, mean repeated because they are very important three virtues of spiritual seekers are mentioned in the 424th verse vasana udayo bhogi vairagisya tadavathi akam bhavo daya bhavo bodhasya paramavathi leena vritte ranupatti maryato vardasta sa so when the sense objects excite no more desire so when we have this passion towards these things we may be we may people will have to live in this world deal with them but one can live in this world without being a slave of sense objects so that's what really happens when our approach or our perception changes the sense objects instead of acting as our masters they become obedient servants then mind also is your friend so if you become if we uh, submit to the impulses of the mind the mind becomes a cruel dictator every moment every second mind be mind is dragged by the five senses of perception the eyes the ears the sense of smell sense of taste and sense of touch all of them drag the mind to its various sense objects and immediately we connect with them and we identify also with what we see when we feel a desire for possessing things that we see what happens mind is dragged mind is enslaved also when we get obsessed with what we hear mind is again being enslaved so all the five senses can enslave the mind now how do we live in this world with these five senses and world so vairagya of dispassion when this happens we will be able to live in the world but immediately the idea that these are all transient things will become a will become a filtering mechanism it saves us it becomes a kind of armor plate it doesn't enslave us but you leave with it that's the idea behind now this can this any person in this world who has a sincere interest in spiritual life can develop as an intellectual filtering mechanism as an intellectual concept when things get too hard when things become too difficult because of our inherent strong Uh, uh, passion or attachment to certain things the word or aversion it could act both ways then when well, these things are impermanent immediately the mind can recollect the statements of the seers and sages and scriptures 
and immediately that enslavement, spiritual enslavement will be, will be weakened. The chains will break. This is what happens. This is what every spiritual seeker is expected to do. This becomes natural for a spiritual aspirant when he reaches an advanced state of spiritual evolution but becomes a means for a beginner. So what becomes a natural faculty of an advanced spiritual teacher, spiritual seeker, becomes a discipline for one to practice at the beginning of, of spiritual life. So that's why it says, you know, when the sense objects uh, emerge in our mind, when we use this dispassion, then their ability to excite our mind will be reduced. But with dispassion, dispassion you cannot close your eyes. Physical, uh, physically if we try to move away from the world of sense objects, it may not always work. You have heard of the story, you know, frequently when we physically deliberately try to move, move away from things, actually our mind will go after them. You heard of the story, an Ayurvedic doctor was approached by a, by a man who was losing his hair. So, that he died, he was actually making fun of this doctor. Do you have any medicine for loss of hair? So, he told him, never think of an egg. Neck resembles a bald, you know, man without any hair. So if you go on contemplating an egg, then you, your head also will become like that. So that because the Ayurvedic doctor knew that this man was making fun of him. And then, you know, every moment he was struggling to think of an egg to avoid thinking about it. <laughs> because if somebody tells you you should avoid m meat and fish, even thinking of it, First, you must think of it, this is meat or fish, then I will not eat it. So the thought itself could pollute the mind. In this context, not everywhere. Physically is a different thing. So this man went on thinking of an egg because he, has, he was struggling hard to not to think about it. So what happened? He lost all his hair as the story goes. So mind has a tendency to go after what it deliberately tries to avoid. So, mind should be turned in the opposite direction. Without struggling to avoid thinking of sense objects, the mind should be turned towards spiritual topics. So, that's the real meaning. So, that is not mentioned in the scripture. So, no one can really mentally move away from things. But we can move towards certain higher ideas. And that will result in our moving away from the undesirable things. So, mind should be given a positive direction to the east, then it will automatically move away from the west. So, that is called dispassion. Dispassion literally means, you know, having no desire, moving away. But in real practice, it means moving towards a hierarchy. So, that is the implied meaning. So one is dispassion, vairagya. The second one is bodha. That's why bodha is bodha means knowledge. So a positive movement towards is the real uh, secret of negative movement of moving away from something. We do not move away from anything. We only move towards a higher idea. Then the teacher tells in the four hundred. For, for understanding the second verse, he says, you also, the teacher tells the student, you also try to practice this truth. You also use your discerning power to understand the supreme truth, the real nature of the self. And once you understand, you, you, you will enjoy bliss and happiness, a kind of inner bliss and joy. Bhavanabhi idam. Paratattum Atmanaka Suruva Atmanam Vicharya Vithuya Moham Sumanap Prakalpidam Mukta Kudartho Bhavadu Prabhutha. 
and then you become Kridartha. Let's say Kridartha and Kridagritya are two words in Sanskrit means when you reach a particular kind of inner blissfulness or inner contentment, we feel a kind of instinctive inner conviction. We have attained what we ought to have attained. We are done what we ought to have done. That comes only when we do something which is helpful in spiritual life. And that is the highest reward of any noble action. The feeling that we get, well, I have done something. Even if we do that, if any noble deed or noble thought, if we do in secret without anybody being aware of it, still, if it produces in our mental system this kind of inner deep root contentment, that is, that is, that is a spiritual element in it. That is true spirituality. So, all great spiritual seekers are able to do great work for others very often without getting anything returned, without expecting anything returned, frequently getting the opposite of it. Because we need a, we need some fuel to keep the engine running, engine of life. So, how, how do we explain this mystery of great spiritual seekers? Sagri God. Well, I can give the example, I cannot give a better example than the example of Swami Tumnadi Dhananda. Because it's such an illustrious example right in front of our own eyes. For just uh, 120 years, 115 years before, this Swami came here, he revived Vedanta society, he did a gigantic work, he had to face storm thunderstorms, not physical, I mean, organizational institution structure, terrible obstacles, all he survived. And within 13 years, he had built this temple, a revived Vedanta society, he had built a magazine, practically, he is the creator of all that we have got in San Francisco, and Berkeley, and Sacramento, and in Lima, and Licked up everything, practically we are all standing on his shoulders. Now, what, or anybody for that matter, you can also take the example of, uh, well, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, you know, she had to run the convent, she had to act like there a lot of problems. So, how are these great spiritual seekers able to withstand obstacles, struggles, challenges, demands, because normally, you know, when you do business, you only expect profit. When we work, we need some incentives, physical, mental, at least some kind of encouragement, appreciation. Without that, you won't have the mental health to continue. Mind will be broken, fatigued. But how do are these great spiritual teachers able to accomplish so much? Because when they do something, their mind produces this unique uh, uh, spiritual experience that is called bliss. It's called Kritakritida and Kritakritida. Well, I have done what I should have done. This is an inner conviction. They may not announce it. But this produces a strong spiritual incentive, a strong feeling of inner bliss and inner contentment, which is very deep very intense, and it sustains you physically and mentally. That's the secret of great spiritual teachers, great spiritual sayings in all traditions. So here, the teacher tells the student, you also use this discerning wisdom that you learn from this text, the real nature of the self, which is of the nature of absolute bliss, and Remove all this delusion from your mind, the wrong idea that you are this body, nothing more than this body, the wrong idea you are nothing but this mind, nothing more than this, this wrong idea you drive away from your mind and realize your supreme Atman. And then what happens? You will have this consummation of your life, this inner bliss and happiness. So, Kudartho Bhavadu Prabuddha you become illumined and you will have this inner contentment, 
this can be you feel that you have attained what you ought to have attained that feeling actually is a great is tremendous spiritual our reward that itself will prompt us to go ahead in spiritual life to the end of the text uh the 517 and 518 there are two important verses it's a very famous verse so i'm quoting i don't have time to fully explain this we'll discuss of course swaraj samraj vibhuti resha bhavat krupa sri mahida prasada prapta maya sri gurave mahatmane namo namaste astu punan namostu the the verse is this now i have achieved this great empire means i have come back to my home i have attained the splendor of this empire this kingdom of spiritual freedom swaraj means one's own spiritual freedom one's own kingdom that's our kingdom our true kingdom our true empire is our own atma and i have attained this by your grace so then the teacher the, the the student salutes the teacher and then the teacher the student tells the teacher mahasupne maya krita jeni jara mrutti gahane bhramandam krishnandam uh, bah, bahula tarata pair anugulam anu, the ahankara vyakra vradhitam imam atyanta kripaya प्रबोध्य प्रसुआपाप्रबोध्यप्रसुआपाप्रबोध्यप्रसुआपाप्रबोध्यप्रसुआपाप्रबोध्यप्रसुआपाप्रबोध्यप्रसुआपाप्रबोध्यप्रस
as an as you know opportunity for continuous perpetual enjoyment it is only a prelude to disaster disaster because what happens you know when such a person is confronted with a with a unpleasant experience it will shock him it could go on for some life cycles but those who are much more highly evolved they may get an opportunity to look beyond the empirical to look deep into the meaning of life when they have to confront a, 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 some kind of a shocking experience and that act as a you know some you are sleeping somebody shakes you you open your eyes so two types of looking at upon the world as a pressure garden the spiritually living soul also lives in this world he doesn't run away from the world but he looks upon this world as something changing as an expression of the divine as a manifestation of the divine he is not caught in the sensory in the external the sensory empirical uh, enjoyments of the world <coughs> even this empirical world of changing things for him is a reminder of the glory of his creator so that's what you find in the gospel of sri ramakrishna a paramahamsa who reached has reached the highest level of spiritual experience he looks upon the world as what a glory what a wonderful this world and the nature and the beauty the grandeur of the, everything will remind him of the greatness of his creator of it of a divine reality behind it that's one way of, one way of looking upon the world so the world can be a great teacher nature can be an open book if you have that perspective otherwise what they are going to you know frequently when we go on working hard and our actually if our actions do not produce the expected and dissipate results it can give us a rude shock to avoid that what we must do we must begin our spiritual journey by this by acquiring this power of spiritual discrimination or uh, discerning wisdom cross jewel of wisdom we break through that one as well and then what happens as we evolve in spiritual life we will reach another state where we will be able to live in this world but you will be caught by that so remember all the great spiritual teachers in vedantic tradition were men and women who enjoyed life every moment you never find sri ramakrishna crying and weeping he was crying and weeping for mother for god not for worldly things sri ramakrishna anyone who went to sri ramakrishna was always happy because he himself was an embodiment of happiness it was some kind of a transcendental happiness that worldly happiness. transcendental happiness i mentioned this to you earlier in study day first day when i read this for the first time years back when i read this bayf pilgrim this uh, russian mystic work when this pilgrim master the jesus prayer for the buddhist for the uh, russian orthodox monk who took him to his private cell and taught him so when he actually Uh, remain we learn the, uh, the secret of remaining in a state of perpetual natural spontaneous prayerfulness then he was happy you find a kind of transcendental joy he expresses it is very similar to what i uh, had much earlier uh, prahlada you find prahlada was a great devotee in the bhagavata purana every day every moment he was crying he was weeping he was joyful because he felt he was in the company of god he was not crying out of misery oh no god i am not able to see you so he felt a kind of uh, god has moved away from you it little child and suddenly oh you are in front of me he becomes happy shedding tears of joy so there is another kind of transcendental joy which comes to a person who lives in this world the other joy is only a temporary absence of misery 
If a person seeks joy at a miracle level, what he will get eventually is only an impermanent, a temporary absence of happiness. Sorry, a temporary absence of unhappiness. What we call joy or happiness in worldly life, an empirical life, is actually only a temporary absence of unhappiness. Because this happiness will go, unhappiness will come. It's like one side of the same coin. So, that's why the student concludes by saying, You have awakened me from this deep slumber or spiritual ignorance or slumber of absence of awareness and you have awakened me to this state of spiritual awareness. I was wandering this thick forest of birth, life, misery and is of course happiness and unhappiness, suffering and enjoyment and again being born again. Now you have uh, taken me out of this rotating wheel of samsara, birth, life and rebirth. So the, the teacher, the student uh, thanks his teacher and uh, he just uh, goes down to the teacher. That's how the text ends. So I have given only a very, very, uh, I would say, superficial uh, bird view of this fairly big Vedantic text which is supposed to be one of the introductory works uh, primers to Advaita Vedanta. So we will have interaction maybe for about uh, 30 minutes. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Swami. Um, in traditional uh, training yeah. of, um, of students um, in, in the traditional m manner, yeah. is this a, a text that would be encountered very young, or yeah. is this a text, or, or a fundamental text? Yeah, it is. It is a. It's a, it should be studied when the student may be around <coughs> 13, 14 years or so, 14, 15 years in the traditional circles. Because normally students are supposed to study grammar and the uh, earlier textbooks like Tattva Bodha, Atma Bodha, uh, there are some small tiny books yeah. which only give you definitions. But this book is supposed to be more elaborate. But in modern times they may study, sometimes this is uh, portions of this book uh, are prescribed for a bachelor of degree in Vedanta in universities. But you remember, the university method is somewhat superficial because the university students do not master the earlier text thoroughly of grammar, uh, mimamsa and other the Indian logic, they don't study thoroughly. But in traditional circles, it is studied much earlier. So much of, a lot of our texts that we, that they used to study much young, uh, during younger years are uh, prescribed in part. Uh, for the university classes. I have never taught in a university, I never studied in a university and I'm grateful and uh, I should thank my stars for that. <laughs> yeah, Because in, in universities, you know, they focus on certain things and you are, uh, I was asked to teach in the Vivekananda University but I politely refused. So, because you have to, the, the you, you know, these Indian uh, spiritual tradition and philosophical tradition has been preserved by scholars who made it a part of their life scheme and not academic. But academies are necessary, universities are necessary, no doubt. But they, they cannot substitute the traditional uh, scholarship. That's it. In, in the university, you won't find teachers quoting for one another, putting together in their own mental world, they do that. They go one after another and so it's uh, everywhere. But this is a very comprehensive text because it gives you the philosophy. Not uh, it, This text doesn't give you an elaborate exposition of Vedanta philosophy that should be kept in mind. It gives a very brief, but it gives many other auxiliary factors. How students should approach the subject, 
what are the qualifications for students and teachers and how you should practice all these auxiliary uh, teachings are included in this book that's all Could you just um, very briefly explain the difference between detachment and dispassion? Yeah, they in in, in the in the translations of Vedantic text they are used more or less in the same sense, but uh, uh, both are used in the same sense. Vairagya is the Sanskrit word for dispassion. Anasati sometimes the Sanskrit word for detachment. But frequently they are, they are used in the same sense. I mean, uh, a sense of renunciation is involved in both these contexts. Renunciation. I mean, mind developing a kind of non attachment, uh, the ability to mentally filter out certain things as of no relevance as of not much significance in spiritual life. So once we develop the conviction that it is not very important, automatically mind uh, will mind won't care for it. Not that you physically run away from it, but uh, you won't give it much importance. So it's, there's sort of a pair, you can use either side of the pair that happens to work at that moment. Like, if you're very passionate about something, you can yeah. become dispassionate and then discern, or if you're in a thoughtful mood, you can yeah, discern yeah, yeah, and then become yeah. dispassionate. Is that it? At the beginning, we will have to strongly practice uh, detachment and dispassion as a positive virtue. When we get fully established in it, then we don't have to exercise it all the time. Mind automatically uh, rejects it as something of no relevance. See, see what we consider to be of very important, uh, very important to little children, they consider chocolates as something very important. But somebody who is suffering, an aged man suffering from diabetes, uh, he may not consider as something very important. So both are the same. They may even eat it, but the attitude is different. Just an example from ordinary life situation. So the most important uh, principle emphasized again and again is developing an interest in higher spiritual values, concepts. Even intellectually, if you can link to link our mind to some higher ideas. That's the beginning of spiritual journey. And uh, what the author says something very interesting, you know. When, when that's the beginning, gradually you develop an ability to feel at home in the company of those great spiritual ideas. Then you have one half the back. So the ability to feel at home uh, in, in the world of these ideas. You, if you read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, you get innumerable examples and illustrations. Sometimes, you know, Sira, you find some youngsters will come to the Dakshinesha temple and they will be wandering the gardens, they will be admiring, appreciating the architect architecture of the, of the temple. And, and the temple was new, it was completed in the year maybe 1854. So, uh, those who visited Sri Ramakrishna in 1860s or early 70s, they were highly impressed by it because the temple was still more or less new. And the temple had become very famous in the banks of Ganga. And it was still far away from the main city of Calcutta. So people used to come there frequently to see the garden, flower garden, etc. That's how uh, uh, Yam's nephew Siddheshwara Majundar happened to tell him there is a temple here built by uh, Rani Rasmani and there is a Paramahamsa living there would you like to go and meet him that's how he ever happened to come there the chronicler of the gospel so youngsters used to come 
some of them will come to the, the will enter the room where Sri Ramakrishna was sitting, talking about spiritual topics. I mentioned this earlier. And some of the youngsters will be sitting, listening closely. Other fellows will be sitting behind, they will be tapping on the on the back. Come on, let us go, let us go. Sri Ramakrishna uh, knew this. So what he would say, he would give a face-saving excuse for them. Oh, why don't you go and uh, uh, see this wonderful garden, the trees, uh, the, why don't you enjoy this, these are wonderful flowers. They also will be happy to move away. Others, their friends will be sitting there listening to sit down. So what's the difference between the two? Among those who sat there and listened to him, you find some of them became his monastic disciples. Some of them became his great householder disciples. Others came, they enjoyed the architecture, the garden and went away. So what was the difference here? Two levels of spiritual evolution. Really speaking, from a purely psychological point of view, you will not be able to tolerate and withstand higher spiritual teachings unless your mind as some spiritual culture. Because when we talk about dispassion, detachment, renunciation, God, transcendental, empirical, it is not a very pleasant experience unless you are interested in it. Because there is nothing that will directly connect with your senses. Nothing very eye-catching about it. <laughs> it's very difficult to tolerate a Vedantic discourse unless you your mind is at the same vibration or frequency. You'll be terribly bored, really speaking. That's why in India I've seen these evangelicals. A lot of entertainment will be there. They will jump from one end of the platform to the other end with the book in, in the left hand with Bible. I've seen. I mean, even I will listen to Billy Graham, who once came to India when I was young. So very entertaining, actually. Thousands of people, they won't feel the passion of time. They'll be sometimes eating, cracking nuts. Sometimes, you know, some of them, they have a wonderful time. But yet this, but those who listen to Sri Ramakrishna, he was talking about God, renunciation and all that. Not easy to tolerate unless you are a spiritual seeker. So Sri Ramakrishna will help them. Oh, you go and see the garden, wonderful that. So unless our mind develops this, this natural tendency to appreciate this, you will be able to tolerate it. <laughs> this is very interesting. Swami, can we force the mind to develop in that direction? Or is it a natural Yeah, we, to, we can make an effort in that. That's true, you're right. Uh, it's possible to make our own effort. So once we become uh, intellectually convinced of the importance of spiritual values, we can do it. But mind may not fully cooperate at that stage. But if you persist, slowly mind will start cooperating. Mm -hmm. Because even if we, we may not have a natural instinctive tendency to appreciate, to feel at home in the world of spiritual ideas, still so if, if, if we are convinced of the need, the eventual importance of it, mind will not, may not fully cooperate at the beginning, but slowly mind will cooperate. That's true. You're right. See, in the case of uh, some uh, this uh, this great devotees who came to Sri Ramakrishna, some of them eventually started coming and sitting and listening, and some of them became devotees. Not at the beginning. If you look at a man like Kesha Chandra Sen, he was a prominent intellectual of the city, he was the leader of the Brahma Samaj movement, he used to give lectures, he visited England. He had a big photo of King Victoria on his drawing room <laughs> and he considered to be some kind of an elite. You know. He may appear to be very ridiculous uh, now, but in those days he was he looked upon himself at least as a big elite. <laughs> this man, he did not visit Mother's Temple in the beginning. He used to come to the Akshaneshwar, he will in a, in a boat with his friends and he was a great man, he was a devotee, he was a Brahma Samaj leader, but did not believe in image worship. 
he he was not willing. Then Master Mahat's people did not accept image worship. They didn't go to temples. So Keshav Chandrasekhar was a leader. Vivekananda and many other uh, of Sri Ramakrishna's monastic disciples uh, used to listen to his lectures. He was a brilliant orator. Very long sentences you find. Very long sentences, very old kind of pompous Victorian, middle Victorian style. So he used to come to the Ekshaneshwar and he would go directly to the Sri Ramakrishna's room. He won't go to the shrine. But this man eventually became a great devotee of mother. And during the last visit, when Sri Ramakrishna paid a visit to uh, Kesha Chandrasen Kamal Kuti, he found he was, his relatives told Sri Ramakrishna, now Kesha is always talking about mother, praying to mother, communicating with mother, is all has become a devotee of mother. This Sri Ramakrishna felt his life was coming to an end, that is a mission. So you find, of course he didn't mention in those so many words, but that's the implication. So you find, at the beginning, even Keshav was not willing, he did not understand the importance of going to the shrine, going down before the shrine. He became a great devotee eventually. Of course, there's a, there's a, Keshav was an illustrious person, not an ordinary person. So I'm not comparing ordinary devotees with Keshav. What happens? At the beginning, even if you have intellectual conviction of the importance of great spiritual ideas, mind may not fully cooperate, but eventually you find mind will slowly reduce its resistance. So, that's how it is. Swamiji, another thing that must have been going on between Sri Ramakrishna and those people is the tremendous love yeah. that was there, the joy. Yeah, that's true. No, the, see, Sri Ramakrishna was open to everyone. Sri Ramakrishna, he was accessible, he was available to everyone to believers, to non-believers, to atheists, to everyone. But uh, the way they responded to Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, see the gradual evolution, some of them were exalted of spiritual seekers by birth, some of them were skeptics, some of them were great intellectuals. Keshav all belonged to a higher circle of devotees. So that's what we understand as we read their life. They, they belong to higher circle of devotees. So we are coming to the conclusion. Om Shanti 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 Hari Ki Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Pranamastu.